Kia ora. This program is brought to you by Wellington Access Radio. Wellington Access Radio, make your voice heard. to the Black House. You're tuning in to 106.1 FM on Access Radio uh, with Leah and Tommy. We're here today with our guest, Zoe Moon. Hi, hi. How are you? She is a original member of Brock Flower. Brock Flower. Brock Flower. Do you, you, you want to let us know what <laughs> Brock Flower is? So Brock Flower was a collaborative project with nine different amazing individuals, all beautiful in themselves. And we came together in our youth to sort of come on the scene and make music together and write music together and it was so cool there were like three vocalists featured including louis baker and my dear friend estia going back to age 10. wow <laughs> yeah um, wow the main producer was pat stewart and he he's a long-term friend from high school and ashton sellers came up and brought a flower gareth blair bear yeah there's a lorenzo num- Pradell. Mm. it was really cool that's incredible. Um, we see, like, uh, w- on the list that there's beats inspired by Jay Dilla, Funko <laughs> Sly, Family Stone. The Roots. Oh, yeah. Man. The Roots. What the a kid to learn from, right? And exactly. And try to pull off and make music with. So you yeah. were, at, were you at Welly High? I was. I went to Wellington High. I actually went to a lot of different schools, but at high school, I finished off at Wellington High School. Yeah, because oh, that's wow. where. So were you at Welly High when Solo, because you were at school with Esther, yeah? Yeah, I think I like I went to school same as Solo for like a year, but he was m- much older than me. So right. like, we never really interacted there. We interacted more through like being part of a breakdancing crew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I say slightly <laughs> awkwardly, but like a sort of crew a la Aro Valley, a la my brother Iman and Vori. And so did you used to go hall. did you used to go into the city on the late and, and come home on the late bus as well? Like a lot of uh, the kids used to break dance in the city and more at the mall. Man is more. I never did any of that. You it didn't was do really that? it was just all like through family sort of unofficial official at the R Valley Hall. Our friend JP would come along. Vori would run these awesome jams where we'd yeah, just get together yeah, yeah, and yeah. dance because she was running the R Hall at that time. Okay. And she just knew that I loved to dance and she was like, you should come along with me. And I started going along and I met all these people and I was like, better at top rocking than any tricks. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. So, Tell us about, you know, your family, your background, you know, like, you know. So much to say. Okay. The genesis. The genesis (laughs) of Zoe Moon. Okay. um, Well, we grew up, well, I was born in Hawaii. Um, My my mother, she she chose to raise us there initially, and my first nine years were lived out beautifully there with my sister Diva, my big sister Diva, my big sister Nani, my brother Amen. We all lived in this house. We had a red van. Yeah. And actually, when we drove around, people knew that the one black family on the island was going by because they had this red van and they, like, <laughs> were singing in harmony. I used to call us like the Black Brady Bunch. It was oh, that, that's oh. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like a beautiful upbringing to sort of learn how to sing because you're riding around with your family and you all have this natural connection to music as the language of spiritual existential expression. So music means family in my head because my dad is a well-known musician my mom is an artist by all means in in its purest form (laughs) from poetry to writing to dancing and she raised us always having music whether it be something that she was playing or something that we were doing and we just were that family that would break out into harmony together wow (laughs) so that's kind of the foundation where wow so that's where so 
you just stated that music means family to you. Yeah. Which is a beautiful statement. How does that all work um, that like every single member of your family is musical? Like, is that? Um, it works because how does it work? I don't, it just is. I don't know. I don't because know. it's like how you were cultivated as yeah. a child. Yeah. yeah, it just, it is the home space culture. What's actually stranger is turning something that you do in the home at the dinner table to celebrate amongst friends when you yeah. throw a party into something that you might make money off of or in front of people. Like that's the stranger, more awkward work is figuring out how to cultivate that in a comprehensive way where it, it, it is a product. Sometimes yeah. that can feel really cold and strange to me because yeah. it's something natural and celebrated in the home space. My dad actually <laughs> often says to me that when he first toured throughout the continent of Africa, because I'm not going to say Africa like it's a country like yeah. so many people seem to continue to do, um, when he was touring throughout the continent, he kept coming across this conversation when people would ask him after a show, like a big show, what do you do? And he'd be like, well, I'm a musician. And then they'd be like, right, but what do you do? Yeah. Because it was perceived back then in the 70s when he was there, like so different That's really than interesting thinking of it as you, work. That's really interesting that you bring that up because, you know, like it's kind of typical in Africa because this was in mm. Africa, yeah? I l heard when I was in Tanzania that, you know, like if you're a musician... It's kind of like it's not something that you aspire to, mm. to being a musician. It's no. something that it's part of the do, culture. It, yeah, but it's part of the culture. But also, like some people have kind of a weird attitude to it. Like yes. they look down on musicians because they could be doing all the shady stuff. Yeah, you know, and like this is something that you do on the side. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. But um, it's amazing, like the music that comes out of Africa. That's a really crazy that's thing. That's true. But can I just say, just here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those listeners out there who don't know who Zoe's dad is, mm. um, Zoe's dad is Taj Mahal, and he's a famous blues musician. He's originally from New York, yeah? Um, yeah, he's from the East Coast, from Massachusetts. Yeah, but he's travelled the world. He's really famous. Look him up on Google. It's, yeah, he's a pretty amazing guy. <laughs> it's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal, yeah. yeah. She did so, mention before he's a Grammy nominated. He's, he's a Grammy award winning. Award pop, winning. Yeah. yeah. Multiple Grammy award and winning. Your sister, blues was, your sister guy. was nominated last year too, wasn't she? Um, she was shortlisted. Shortlisted. For her first album, and she won a couple of other awards. Yeah. Wow, but um, oh, and I think one of the songs that she did with Dad were nom Grammy nominated potentially. Right, but also, yeah. I don't know how I feel about the Grammys. I have issues. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'm not sure if that's the benchmark for what good music and art yeah. is anymore because there's just so much like there's so much drama going on around Gatekeeper drama, yeah. like long standing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. structural racism all intertwined in that yeah. and it's still like obviously because it has rep been represented as the benchmark of you have succeeded and then if you get a Grammy trust it will change your career um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I like I would like to imagine that I can feel strong enough in myself to n not acknowledge that benchmark as the whether or not I am of value because it is definitely it's definitely intertwined with so much. It's, yeah, so much I think a that lot of disempowers people's... black people for a long yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people are starting to realize that, aren't they? Mm. They're actually having those conversations about the Grammys quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and and I mean, if it doesn't <clears throat> represent you no. or your music, and it's representing a value set that's very foreign, why mm. why give it all that uh, adulation? Also, in the present world. I think people are not sure what to do when they realize a certain structure needs to be decolonized mm -hmm. and reevaluated. Like, do you keep this this award that represents you are a successful person at the top of music, but we know has like disempowered black people and people of color for so long amongst mm -hmm. other very flawed aspects of it? Do we do we do we keep it as the benchmark and just shift it around or does something new need to rise in its stead? Yeah. But also to do that is a different thing than yeah. to want that. Yeah. yeah. Because you have to build, like, you'd have to build something else that other people would say, hey, this is where the real value yeah. is. Yeah. Right. From you the know? ground up. From the ground up, I guess. 
I, I don't mean, know, but I mean, sometimes like maybe they do have to move things around. Yeah. Remove all those old white fellas and put some, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Get rid of the statue <laughs> of the colonizer and put, yeah. Some, yeah. put the people in its stead. You I know don't what know. I think a good Grammy would look like would be like that that thing in Nigeria where they've got, or Ghana, where they've got that big statue and it's got the baby on the shoulder Ooh, and pointing yeah. out to see. That would be a really cool Grammy. Like an that alternate Grammy. An alternate Grammy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like something of that status, but like... Yeah, mm. like a different award yeah. ceremony. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We're uh, so, solving the world's problems in music. We love that. We love that. Speaking of music in general, do you find that like because you are in the business of making music, does it ever get competitive? Or is it just really like respectful of like art, like people's individuality and um and their artistic ventures um does it get competitive i think it depends on where you are it depends on like what level you're working in most professionally i've worked as a backup vocalist to this point like i managed to go on to a world tour with keb mo and my father for a year wow like all around europe and all around the u.s uh, we went to the caribbean we went to mexico we Traveled. We really did it. Yeah, I've seen the picture <laughs> yeah. of you in Montreal. <laughs> yeah, North Sea Jazz Festival. All those like festivals you just dream to ever play at. Wow. Amongst musicians, you dream to be in a backstage area with. So it was a huge learning experience there. But um, I would say once you're within the machine of like a proper, proper industry level, like Grammy nominated tour, just talking about the Grammys, like it's something in my world, which it's not, trust. But um it once you're in that world and infrastructure, it's like you are the cog as positioned. There's a, there's a hierarchy to everything, and there has to be for it to be able to travel and move. Like you are the backup vocalist, you stand in your position, you do that. I I wouldn't necessarily say there was I wouldn't say that it was competition. It was more just like knowing your role, knowing yeah. your place. Yeah, which can get very interesting as a black woman working yeah. in this industry. Yeah, but then as a solo artist here in New Zealand, I wouldn't say it's competitive. It's more just like there maybe are less opportunities and it's it's a, it's a smaller scene. Yeah. So you have to be fast to like get, book the studio time and book the venue and you have to just sort of use the resources in the smaller scale right. to get in the spot. So you just have to look forward thoughtfully and be organized, which I struggle with. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Well, we're going to go into our first music break. Um, this is from Zoe's group, uh, Brock a Flower, <laughs> and the song is Conversations. You're tuning into The Black House with Leah and Tommy. Oh, 
was <laughs> Conversations by Brocka Flower. You're tuning into the Black House with Leah and Tommy on 106.1 FM Access Radio. So, Hi. Zoe, um, please do tell us about your experiences at the Bontanic. Specifically, the Bontanic Gardens Magic. Oh, the, Bot- the Gardens Magic. Fr- yeah. Yes. At the beginning of this year, I was chosen to play headline an amazing gardens magic show featuring my new music my solo music with um darren mathiason and leonardo Calchini as support and it features was like the first big big show where i featured what my new project where i've started producing myself um i've always been a writer but like I'm definitely somebody who's a little bit technologically allergic. (laughs) Oh, right. You know, like I struggle to, I've always been that way. And in the rise of computers, I was like still trying to turn in assignments, handwritten, like a crazy person. I just, I I probably from my island upbringing, I have this aversion. Wow. (laughs) It's it's so funny because I feel like people outside of, New Zealand or like people that think of New Zealand would think like New Zealand's kind of like Hawaii. Like in yeah, the sense of which the, it's not at all. Yeah. I think people are learning now thanks to like Lord of the Rings and Weta and all that. They're like, oh, all these amazing things are happening in New Zealand. But um, I guess, yeah, getting to what I mean about the project, I started producing on my iPhone <laughs> in a wow. very Steve Lacey sort of way. I started producing my harmonies and writing my songs and doing full arrangements and just seeing if I could. And I found out that I could arrange the full bass line and, and I could do more than just sing soft songs on my guitar when I was by myself, like, because I've always had the full vision of the music in my head and I'm not, I do, okay, I'm not going to say what I'm not. I don't have the skill sets technically to be able to like play it all by myself and I'm not a looper, yep. but I needed a way to communicate the full arrangements that I had in my head, and I finally found one through producing on my iPhone. And we use the samples of my harmonies and some of the like bits of beat and ideas, and then we play them through SPD. And then Leo does the chords, and then I sing. And it was it was more than I ever imagined. I got to imagine a whole vision of what we would wear and what it would represent, and play the songs that I've been hearing in my heart of hearts for so long and hear them sound exactly as I feel them for the first, one of the first times really. And it, it was huge for me to play amazing. and be able to share that with, also it was really important to share that with a wider demographic, not just at a bar, but somewhere where kids could see it and elderly could come. That's what's so beautiful about events like gardens. Yeah. Wow. Have you been there, uh, yet, Tommy, to the Botanic mm, Gardens to the music? Not for the music. It's I think really maybe nice as a in kid. The summer. Yeah, maybe as a kid. Gardens Magic is always worth it because it's a good place for new acts to sort of debut in front of a proper audience, and it's a, or bigger acts to like connect with the wider scheme of community. Like I was saying, mm. just because there aren't that many events where we can play to more than like those who uh, will drink and yeah. then watch the yeah. show, which is great too, because there's different things you can do in the club that you can't do in front of like all ages, you know? Yeah. But at the <laughs> same time, it's really important to me to have that opportunity to connect to as many people as possible because I mean, I feel like most musicians want to connect to people yeah. and show who they are. And I've never felt musically more like myself than that show. And then the shows after that, from that point, I think. This new, this new sound feels mm, like myself. Wow. So, like, where you know, like you see, you mentioned a few places that you've been before that you were, that you toured at. Where besides Europe and the US, where else did you say you'd you'd tour? Um, so I went on tour with my beautiful sister Diva Mahal for her Run Deep tour, which is a world tour as well. We went around the US, sort of basing in New York and then sort of spurting out to different places. And then we also did a little mini tour in Europe, mainly like Paris and the UK. And then we did some touring in Mexico and places like that. What was that like? Um, It was crazy. Uh, It was like one show. It was beautiful. It was so I always say that we have like this blood harmony thing going on. I was talking about how when we drove around growing up with like the Black Brady Bunch. But there's definitely something with me and Diva singing together because we have found ourselves 
even though we're like 10 years apart, be very similar in terms of our interests. We're both vocalists. We're both passionate about a lot of the same things. We both love fashion and style and design and expression in these fields. So as a result, I mean, that's one of the things that has helped us be really close. Yeah. And after we did the Taj Moore tour, singing backup vocalists, sing backup vocals together, it's just, it felt so foreign and strange to <laughs> separate that. Yeah. And she needed somebody to sing B-Views for her tour, her first studio album release. And why not bring on your sister who's yep. like made from the same and yeah. <laughs> get like the best blend possible. Absolutely. <laughs> and so we did. And I, I had the opportunity to tour with her and learn more about being an artist and, and from her because, I mean, she's amazing. Um, and there's definitely something great about being a dynamic black girl magic duo with your big sister. Absolutely. Wow. Across yeah. the world. And Divas, <laughs> you know, like like I've heard, I don't know if I've heard you both singing together, but I've mm. definitely seen Diva back in the day. You were probably too young. Maybe you were still at... No, yeah. I snuck in to Hope Bros. Yeah, you did? <laughs> I may have been 12, but I still went to that gig. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, we're on radio. <laughs> no, yeah. like, now everybody uh, knows. I was a good kid, you know? There's nothing wrong with me seeing the music yeah, and good sitting on, yeah. peacefully and enjoying family time. That was family time for me. Uh, have, you, have you toured with any other of your siblings? Um, I've toured a little bit with my brother around New Zealand back in the Omega Supreme days. Uh, we have a couple of tracks like floating around on the internet together. Um, and I learned a lot from him. I, I used to dance. I think people might vaguely remember a red, green, and yellow <laughs> tasseled yeah. outfit in my youth. I think it was like 15 or 16, dancing at Splore, <laughs> Sound Splash, and yeah. a little dance crew for my brother's fabulous show, and then sing BBs and stuff like that. He always, he's, he's a, I always think of him as a musical mad scientist with his wide abilities. So yeah, yeah totally he a little bit with like him. amazing. Yeah. I really like his music. Like it's so different. Yeah, and it's like I love the. I love. I'm. I'm a big fan of hip hop. Yeah, and I love the way he plays with it. He plays with so many. Mm. He plays with roots. He plays with hip hop. He plays with rap. There's just so. He is himself, and he is capable. Any instrument that he's ever grabbed, he has the focus and the ability to learn that instrument and let it, like synchronize with who he is mm. and express that and that's an incredible ability to have it's a and he's worked hard for it and he's happy to have his own space and let it be what it is like it's he's a pure artist and yeah. it's truest form for sure shout out to i'm on star absolutely yeah. hey um tommy why don't you have a yarn because i know you're a model oh and okay. i know now that <laughs> zoe loves fashion ah. so i think this is really your department okay yes, tell me tommy <laughs> so um i don't know about anyone else who doesn't follow uh, Zoe on Instagram. Moon Zoe. Exactly. Good time to let them know. Um, but you, <laughs> you, you uh, did a little BTS. You had like a little BTS of your latest shoot. How was that? Oh, it was so fun. I it was actually totally a surprise project that came around, but I ended up to having the opportunity to creative direct and work with these amazing women. Oh wow! This incredible photo shoot, and they let me style it to my desire and they photographed it beautifully in this incredible space um tabitha arthur and a beautiful photo nz if you want to follow them and um is this for a particular kind of project that is yet to um, be disclosed they approached me i see they saw my instagram they thought it was fabulous they, saw, they knew me through diva i think a mutual friend and they asked they wanted to photograph an interesting and exciting you, woman you, such as myself. How, how do you feel when you're modeling? Because I'm just, I'm just curious. I love, okay, I love modeling. My first experience of model, oh, well, not my first, but one of my most official experiences to this day of modeling was actually for a brand called Mirica Lee Jeans. And um, she had me and Diva model her jeans when she gave us a it, pair. It, was it in New York? It was in New okay, York. Okay, I, I recall. You know the one? Thing. And yeah, we yeah. were just totally like, 
yeah. leaning <laughs> on like the aisles of a grocery store. Like yeah. it is like the catwalk that never ever before had been that fabulous. Like, yeah. <laughs> like Campbell's soup never got hugged like it I, got hugged. I that have day. to s- I have to say it's it's the best thing ever when you're <laughs> It's literally like dress up and it's people don't, so and it's fun. acting, it's, it's acting in, in like frames and yes. shots and bringing and the kind of, exactly, uh, yeah. And it's, it, I, I feel like there's a way to model and do fashion that is just wasteful and stupid and <laughs> capitalism and consumerism. And then there's a way to do it where it is like expression and art and it's feeling and it's human interest. Yeah. And I, I love finding that sweet spot there. Yeah, I feel that. Where there's a personhood and a creative vision that just looks right. I never like anything to look like it's put on a person. I like it to look like it's evoking an emotion. So being able to have a little creative reign for the photo shoot that you're talking about was really exciting. And I realized that I have a passion for styling. Well, I didn't realize I realized that I have a passion for styling that could be embraced by other people. And they'd be like, you're good at that. (laughs) (laughs) Instead of like, what are you doing, Wheeler? Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. I've just got one question yes. before you go to our song break. What would you call your music? I would in call, terms of genre. Ooh, um, I've been toying with the idea of folk R and B. And the reason why I say folk R and B, I say folk in the sense to represent the old. Because I definitely have this fascination with blaming the old and the new, like the ancient, channeling our ancestors, early music, which we all know is like Black people invented so many different art forms. <laughs> and, and a lot of that knowledge in terms of the mainstream has definitely been removed. And for so long, I think about so many different disciplines of music that are rooted in early blues and early country and early, early jazz. And, mm. and so many times through moments of oppression, it has been black culture to create these ideas. Mm. And I wanted... I wanted very much to speak to that heritage that's been a huge part of all the things going on in my head when I go to write a song, like the classic nature of songwriting yep. and music and the classic kit that we all pull from. Yeah. And then the R&B is, is sort of alluding to the language of the modern as- more modern aspects and the rhythm that speaks to me because I think with this new music that I hope to be having coming out soon, I've finally found a way to be my dancing dynamic self within my own space and my own stage as well as channeling my ancestors in how I express it. So I call it folk R&B. It's also because I play ukulele to like beats and <laughs> amazing musicians that support Wow. Me. Yeah, and the ukulele is very uh, popular very, in Hawaii too. Yeah, <laughs> just bringing in a little bit of my Hawaii it's ohana popular, and culture. And it's popular, it's popular right through the Pacific. There's yeah. a really particular way that people expect to hear the ukulele as well and mm. I definitely like to flip it. Like I like to come up with songs that sound like R- like you don't think of R&B with the ukulele except for like a nice chimey noise on the top but mm. I have a six string and it gives it a, a dirtier wilder almost mandoliny sound which oh. gives it a point of interest and makes you think of like older instruments yeah and so that again is sort of why i call my music folk r&b that's yeah. that's awesome so we're gonna go on to the next song it is also from the collective um Broca flower and the song is called gotham you're tuning into the black house with leah and tommy on 106.1 fm Shadows have been congealed and twisted and tainted Well, you know the rest Come on! Well, it's a miracle you have no set of the subliminal messages heading your way The subliminal messages had no way
That was um, Gotham by the collective group Broca Flower. You're tuning into the Black House with Leanne and Tommy on 106.1 FM with Zoe today. Hi, hi. I'm really enjoying this conversation. We're having oh. such we're having such good conversation in between. I know. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry, it's coming on. Mic. If yeah, only you could be in the room, right? And um, <laughs> the thing that I'm uh, wanting to ask you about is well, you've actually spoken quite a lot about what inspires your music. Mm. Um, I, I want to talk to you about, like, I saw you at the BLM mm-hmm. march and you were dancing up a storm and, you know, I actually filmed you guys in that circle. That was so cool. It I was, was thinking, cool. look at this, we're, we've got a whole circle of black people dancing on the beehive grounds. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah. it be great if we could Hip-hop. make it a regular thing somewhere where we get together and, Absolutely. and express in a way that feels safe and in solidarity and amongst fellow mm. people who maybe aren't looking at it and wanting to grab it or copy it, but like are are actually a part of that community and able to express it and share it with that safe sense of fellow black people. Yes. (laughs) Yes. What I wanted to ask you is, um, what's your views on the BLM global impact at the moment and its its impacts in New Zealand in particular, Mm. if you know what I mean? I am known as a rather lengthy speaker and verbose person generally but um, I'll try to keep this as concise as I can because that's a lot that's like everything I've been thinking about for the last five months in intensity but then greater than that my whole life but um what are my views uh I feel like Black Lives Matter it's it's beautiful to see it come into the popular sense it's beautiful to see people waking up who otherwise might not have considering events of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others, but it's also a strange feeling because racism isn't new. 
uh, police brutality is not new. In America, absolutely not new. It's part of the actual infrastructure of the society. And then seeing people here in Aotearoa see it and awake, like awaken <laughs> is great and all, but I also experienced a lot of people wanting me to do their homework for them. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I experienced a lot of people going, oh, wow, this really sucks for your community that this oppression that I realize affects you directly. Mm. Please teach me about it. Mm. When Google is a thing. Exactly. Google like, it. And <laughs> there is a plethora <laughs> of resources for people to seek pull that, out. Pull that little computer out your pocket and Google and it, it. And then when the excuse is, oh, but what do I look for? It's like, for anything else you want to learn about, you just have to type it in and see where it gets you like any other type of research. Yeah. And maybe I will totally acknowledge that not everybody has access to those things. Mm. So then you ask people. But it's also a certain sense of entitlement and othering in the way that people have asked for that information for me that has been pretty that? difficult. Like just sort of someone who maybe never ever would speak to me normally right. suddenly yeah, yeah. being like hey tell me all about this thing Almost i really want to know like an interrogation yeah yeah um one of the more, more difficult experiences was um the vigil right. <laughs> for me it was really interesting standing in that crowd and being one of the very few black american faces because right. that's different than just being yeah. any part of the black diaspora in this particular case yeah yeah and having a couple of different photographers like chase me like chase you chase not you. necessarily running after me but like try to take a photo i clearly say please don't take a photo right now i don't want a photo and then disrespect that and still take photos or like really a guy that i i literally said directly to please don't take this photo of me right now i'm not in a space where i want to be photographed which is my human right <laughs> you and know he still took and it then anyway. he went away and tried to take a photo from behind me. and so like feeling targeted in what should be a space of grieving was awful yeah it was awful it's it just felt like so i have to go home and close my doors to actually be able to process yeah generational grief right now yeah. because this is a convergence of generational grief that we're looking at with black lives matter it's not a new thing it's black people have been been being murdered for their blackness and treated as resource rather than human or agent for you know 400 years plus within yeah. america and and across the diaspora and also the way we get blended together from this vantage point here in Aotearoa as like yeah. one thing can yeah. be hugely problematic because people don't know the difference. Like years, yeah. you were talking to me about coming up with Diva and Shiva and Esther and <laughs> like seeing more and more black people come to Aotearoa, yeah. which is great. But I mean, m the amount of times where I've been mistaken for Esther or mistaken for Shiva. Yeah. And it's all about what my hair looks like. You know? Exactly. I, I, it's like I don't exist. It's like I got braids, so I must be this person. Yeah. And I remember that actually back in yeah. the days. I got mistaken for other people as well. I still do. People, yeah. Because of people your can't, hair, yeah. Styles, yeah. Like, like I, used to I mean, people can't tell whether that. I'm a man or a woman. I will be holding my partner's hand in a dress and people just don't have that exposure and I understand that you're mm. removed from the culture you're not as close to it but the excuse that we aren't here doesn't work because we are here we exist here in yes. yeah. so it's like there is an importance to educate yourself and I'm really mm. glad to see people doing it but I, I I don't know I'm at odds I have this feeling like it sort of feels with yeah. the popularity and the hashtag culture of it. It feels like that friend that didn't dig you in high school, that paid no yeah. attention to you, yeah. and then realizes later in life that maybe you're really cool now and acts like you were always friends. Like yeah. there's some, it's, it can at times feel disingenuous yeah. Yeah. when it's not authentic allyship and it's not all about the optics and what it looks like. What it like, looks, yeah. Don't you look like, like the rules of what it takes to look like a good mm -hmm. person change now. Mm. And so you want my help to still look like a good person. Like you're still looking to me as a resource when, you know, yes. I'm grieving. Yeah. And that's Rather capitalism. than a person. Because mm. like the people that checked yeah. in, there's a difference between the people that checked in and went like, hey, how are you doing? Yeah. Then the people are like, hey, give me something else yeah. at this time. Yeah. And I think it would be really good for people to reflect on that as well. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't want to discourage people on a journey towards allyship because none of us are perfect. Yeah.
Yeah. Every, everyone has so much to learn. I have so much work to do in myself in this moment in order to like be a greater part of the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm the most imperfect person I know. <laughs> exactly. And it's just, <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> aren't we all, though? Yeah, aren't we all to be honest, ourselves? We're flawed. the most imperfect people that we know. And I feel like... What was I going to say? I was going to say, there's. I feel like there's a general tone of dissociation just because there's so many things yeah. to be broken and hurt and anxious about. I, I feel inundated with them myself, and I know so many people who care do. Mm. So It's almost like it's inten- like the way that um, we're looking at the situation or even experiencing this situation at this point in time has become even more intense. Yes. Like it's always been there, but yeah. it's like we've got this intensity now about it. And it's, it's, I find sometimes I find it really triggering. Well, you know? I find it really triggering when it feels like it's only real now because a wider amount of white people understand that it's a problem. Mm. That hurts because yeah. it's like, I've been living this problem my whole life ever since yeah. I was a little kid yeah. being told I was a bitch because I was black. Yeah. At age five or six. And you were an angry black when you were 12. (laughs) Apparently, you know, and I was already a woman when I was eight and it was already time to like hypersexualize me and Mm. I never have a clear identity. And I mean, just last year I was working in a shop and somebody came in and said, oh, you can't belong here and pointed to the white woman next to me and said, but you can. So it's like racism isn't new and treating it like it's a surprise is painful to watch when you have to live it every day. So it creates this layer of separation. But at the same time, I'm at odds with myself because I want to invite people in to Mm. start a journey towards authentic allyship to use Google and ask the questions and yeah. I would love to be a resource but I feel more of a need to be a resource to my fellow to your, black yeah. community here in Aotearoa yeah. and my family like my pre- like the black lives that matter in my life I need to learn to yeah. remember that my black life matters yeah. <laughs> and and to take care of myself because sometimes it feels like when you see a black woman's life be taken and not matter structurally. And not mentioned, yeah, not mentioned, right? Not yeah. mentioned. Yeah. And you see, you see all the excuses that fall in the way to sit, or like a black trans woman's life not matter. You just, you just wonder, you're just like, is this the reality? Is yeah. this, is this the world? Is this how the world feels in the machine of it? And then the way it works, does yeah. that mean that I get, I, I'm in danger? Yeah. And of course there's a safety here. Mm. But there's also a naivety here yeah. that can sometimes be painful to feel constantly at the need to be like a black ambassador. It's yeah. a word I coined. Yeah. You know, like I got to represent everybody. It's like I am not every black person. No, I am me. No. And if you start treating me like me as a person, taking me for who I am, then we can have a conversation. Yeah, because you know, you're not you're not how you not uh, you aren't what people perceive. You're a human being yes. first. And I think that's kind of the um what do you call it when when you're white people have that as an entitlement and it's almost like we're trying to aspire right. to being human be able to be treated human yeah. and that fight that emotional labor that's happening constantly mm. if you've never experienced it it's it's hard to be conscious of it but there are so many books there are so many blogs there are instagram pages there are twitter pages there are so many resources yeah. out there ready for you to just go out and find but you have to choose to look them up like you, anything else i'm, I'm curious like do you know when we're all together um do you do you feel like um we're perceived as just one because like you mm. know speaking of speaking of the virgil yeah um, i find that like um that photographer doing that to you was just capitalizing off of that's your disgusting pain. honestly if we're able to find find this individual and actually <laughs> so that we should take multiple multiple yeah, photos of him. Take, <laughs> we just run take up on him at work and like hey right. we just want a photo wait a minute i'll stand behind you See, take photos because yeah. the thing the is hell? it's like it's like if you took matters into your own hands and actually like went towards him then it's like oh then, then you're I'm the stereotype scary. then i'm the mm. scary black woman yeah. stereotype if, yeah and it's like so and it's we like, have yeah. a reason to be angry right we have this we have all this pain but like where is the space that is safe to process it How? that is facilitated somewhere where we're perceived almost as like not actually being a community that's here but just like little exotic bird bright spots oh yeah. within the oh, yeah. fishbowl to look at and be exotic. like oh you're so exotic where are you from your skin's so shiny your skin's so shiny yeah. your teeth you are so your white, white. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like yeah and like see and and and, it, and 
we have this conversation. You're like, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. But there are so, still so many rooms here because of a certain <laughs> overwhelming naivety that mm. we face in terms of talking about Black Lives Matter, yeah. where the response will be, oh, my God, really? Yeah. Oh, my God, really? Yeah. And the, oh, my God, really actually hurts as well. Yeah. It's I, hard to explain that to people. Mm. Yeah, because like... Because you've yeah. been able to live in a world where racism doesn't exist in you, but like... In your, in your, in your bubble. bubble. Yeah. But, but racism, yeah. I'm sorry, what do you think colonization is? Mm. <laughs> what do you think deciding that one people's life doesn't count and overriding it by force is it, yeah. it it's racism and it yeah. once you start a system from that place it it follows through exactly i think we need to go to the next song oh we do <laughs> we yeah. got into oh, it wow yes. yeah i think we do <laughs> oh my goodness We're getting into it the and next song, like, I, we haven't even finished it Tommy, we haven't but, you know. we uh, anyway well the next song that we'll be playing is where are you from slash people say my teeth look so white with wow. a stare um and <laughs> with, this a is stare. From, uh, with a stare with a stare and this is this is uh, from The Collective, Broca Flower. You're tuning into The Black House with Lee and Tommy on 106.1 FM Access Radio. To the Black House with Leah and Tommy on 106.1 FM and our guest today, Zoe. So we have to go through some adverts and then we'll wrap this show. Yeah, okay. So, oh all right. First of all, I want to do a shout out for uh, Raz Judah and the Culture Embassy. They're at Moon Tonight in Newtown and they're bringing live roots, reggae, and pan African music. And it's featuring the Wellington based 10 piece band, uh, the Culture Embassy. With support from DJ Junior Ranks, it's ten dollars at the door. Don't come with two dollars. Come with ten dollars. Yes, yeah, they're here to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Also, we've got a uh, a new lady. Yes, real estate agent. Real estate agent. Her name is Gisela Nubo Machena, and she works for Harcourts. If you're looking to buy a house, contact her. Her number is o two one one seven nine. 
1170. Um, yeah, I'm going to put this, this this card up on our page later so people can get all the details. Perfect. Um, also, I want to do a shout out for people in Auckland right now. Our friend DJ Oracle, she's got a space where you can escape your daily stressful obligations, bring your loved ones and little ones along, and learn how to move to African beats every Wednesday at Empire Studios. Now, if you don't know who uh, DJ Oracle is, she came down to Wellington last year for an event for our event we had at Blue Nile with Afrocentrics, and everybody turned up for that. She's just the best DJ ever. So every Wednesday night from six thirty to seven thirty. $10 at the door. Don't come with two bucks. Guys, we know how you want to do this African trading. Yeah. It's not happening. <laughs> Bring the money. Exactly. <laughs> we also have one more um, not shout two more. Oh, two more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got... Okay, well... Um, in Auckland, uh, we have our guest today, Zoe, who's going to be opening for Diva Mahal, her sister. And you can access... Uh, you can get tickets on www.divamahal.com slash tour. Um, you can follow her on Instagram to get that information. It is sale will be going off 5 p.m. on Monday, and it is for show September 3rd at the Tuning Fork and the Fork Lay Sawmill. So I'm just going to say that one more time. North and Auckland. Um, the Tuning Fork in North Auckland or somewhere in the north. Um, and Lay Sawmill. It's somewhere in the north. <laughs> it's up there. North, I north, I north, north, north of here. And yes. oh, do you want me to do this last yes, one? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, we've got, also, we've got Susie Atsudogby of Afro Fashion Dress Designers in Berenpore. Now, I don't know if you guys watched the project last night, but Winston Peters was going on like, and when they open those borders, you're going to need, you're going to need masks on hand. So, um, she makes masks. Guys, um, African indeed. fabric masks, they're oh. really nice. I've already bought, I've already bought like two for my family and I bought some for my brother and it took ages to, for it to arrive and then he sends me a message saying, it's arrived in Tanzania. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I, I like Tanzania didn't have African musical, um, right. African material already. He, but, uh, he yeah. wow. <laughs> but he goes, no, I want, I want something sent from New Zealand. Mm. He's so funny like that. So you can contact Susie um, on... 021-238-0283 or contact her on Suzy Atsu, that's S-U-Z-Y-A-T-S-U, 1978 at gmail.com. And we'll put her details up on the page later. And lastly, of course, we've got all the guys from Eagle Eye Painters, CNC Moving and Logistics. Everybody needs a mover, so, you know, get in contact with Unesu there. And uh, we've got Sackmart's Auto and all you guys that need your cars hooked up, fixed up, whatever, uh, just contact P with there. All the details are on our Facebook page. So that's all. Our, that's our wrap-up for for the shout-outs today. Perfect. Um, well, yeah, what's in future for Zoe Moon in oh. our last couple of minutes? Well, in future, I've got a couple of recording dates booked, so hopefully I'll be able to get a single out soonish in the next few months. I've been saying it for a while. I know people, but when you book recording sessions during what is to eventually be COVID-19 lockdown period, best laid plans change, but we're still going to make it happen. Um come rain or shine or anything else in between. Perfect. <laughs> um, the yeah. music is developed. I've, I, everything's written. I have an album's worth of music, and I just got a piece together, dot the I's and cross the T's. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been a development period that has been really exciting for me and empowering, but I'm also constantly terrified because wouldn't any woman, mm. <laughs> face, black woman facing this world trying to make something be? I mean, I question whether or not making music is even possible in a post-COVID Black Lives Matter world. But you just you have to find a way. And that's what I'm working on. So Yeah, people, you, yeah, you have to like, people are starting to get more creative about yeah. how they present themselves now. It has to be completely I'm, different. I'm seeing so many online things that yeah. are happening. You know, like, uh, you know, I watched the thing about the um, referendum. Yeah. Um, that was down at Biz Dojo last yeah. week. And um, that was really interesting to watch that. I couldn't make it, but yeah. they're, they're putting it online. I think the more that people put things online, I don't know how it's going to go with making money. Yeah. 
that's that's probably the difficult thing you think right figuring out how to do a live pro- broadcast on like instagram live or something mm. and figuring out how to like charge for something like that mm. is crazy but i mean you can definitely connect that way in a grand yeah. scale and mm. people are hungry because a lot of people still in the states and and in europe and around the world are unable to go to a show so that's why i mean it's beautiful to see people really yeah love and cherish live shows and so i have that show with my sister um you'll be able to look for the tickets on my instagram page moon.zoe as well awesome. if you want to follow awesome. 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 coming up thank you so so much zoe for being a guest today you have been incredible thanks for this is me. the black house on access radio with leah and tommy 106.1 fm and we'd love to see you back yes please That program was brought to you by Wellington Access Radio. Get your voice heard. Thanks New Zealand On Air for funding accessmedia.nz. .nz. 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 .nz.